Hello and welcome dear students to the course of MS495 that is Green Supply Chain Management being offered by the Department of Management Sciences here at GIK Institute for the semester spring 2020. Okay, uh, we will be having our recorded session two uh, for the topic life cycle assessment. So this is more of a continuation to the previous lecture that has already been recorded and shared with you people over various platforms. All right, people, I'll just try to go through this thing uh, once more just to let you know exactly where we are and how the things will be in the future. So this is our week one of the recorded lectures and this is our session two and the lecture will be uploaded on YouTube once it's complete. So nonetheless to worry about, we are still covering the topic of life cycle assessment. Moving ahead, exactly, I'll let you know the learning outcomes for today. The previous outcomes have been covered in the previous session, that was session one. So for today, exactly what we are going to learn is that the students will be able to learn the standards and common frameworks used for measuring LCA or life cycle assessment. Uh, the next two learning outcomes will be discussed in the lectures that will be held in the future weeks. So we'll look at, uh, into them later on. All right, people, uh, starting on with life cycle assessment, before I proceed ahead, I'd like you to give you a brief uh, intro once again about life cycle assessment. I told you that LCA is a comparative study used to measure environmental or human health degradations that are caused by any certain product, any sort of a process, or any uh, particular site. So that is what all LCA is about. Uh, getting on to the standards and the framework for LCA. So exactly what are the standards that are being used and what is the most common framework that you used to measure your LCA? We'll be discussing this in today's lecture. Before I proceed further, I would like you to recall a previous concept from the topic scope of emissions, where we had discussed scope one, two, and three of emissions. Scope one was where we had direct emissions. Scope two was where we were looking into indirect emissions. That was mostly because of using utilities like electricity or gas. Uh, scope three emissions was something more, more relevant to transportation, people, or uh, inventory coming up at your site using transportation that is not directly under your control, but obviously you need that. The next thing I would like you to recall is global warming potential, where we had discussed that exactly global warming potential is a measure that lets you know that over a period of one year, 10 years, or 100 years, or 500 years, which particular gas or greenhouse gas will be uh, contributing more towards uh, global warming. Similarly, we had also discussed energy requirements in our previous lectures. So energy requirement is more towards how much exactly each process or product consumes energy in the process of either manufacturing or we might say that a particular transportation is consuming this much amount of energy. So all these are sources of energy and the units used to measure them are gigajoules, kilojoules or megajoules. All right, people, the most common standard used by the practitioners to measure LCA is ISO 14 of 40, 2006. The salient features of the framework have been identified in the Gerwin diagram. So let's look into this. First thing of ISO 14 of 40, 2006, let me tell you that this, uh, this current framework is still in practice and being used by the practitioners around the world. So nothing to worry about. This is the latest one. First part is goal and scope definition. Similarly, uh, all these arrows are representing an iterative process because you can't simply set a goal and scope, move on to inventory analysis and finally move on to impact analysis. No, you need to change your values. You need to change your goal and scopes based on what sort of data you are getting, what is the data availability, exactly what the scope you had set. So this is more of an iterative study where you have to go back and forth between all these stages. So you set a goal and scope. The next part is inventory analysis. Once you complete that, you move on to impact assessment. And finally, across with each and every stage, you move along with the interpretation stage as well. So this is more of an ISO 14 or 40 framework. These are the processes that are, have been highlighted and are used uh, for measuring life cycle assessment. 
Okay, let's move into details of exactly what the goal and scope definition is. So before I set my goal and scope definition, the first part is really I need to know who my audience are. The next part is I really need to know that what are the key deliverables of this study. Exactly is this study being conducted for the consumer's perspective? Is this being conducted for an organization's perspective? perspective what do they really want are they looking more interested into the environmental impacts are they more interested towards measuring the health hazards or is the company more interested in having a comparative assessment of their product with any other competitive products so uh, getting into goal and scope definition basically it is defining the functional unit so scoping the product system deciding which activities and process belong to the life cycle of the product that is studied similarly within goal and scope selecting the assessment parameters the impact that shall be assessed in the study selecting the geographical and temporal boundaries and settings of the study and the level of technology that is relevant for the process in the product system and finally designing the relevant perspective to apply for the study so uh, I'll try to move to the next slide and I'll explain you exactly how do we set up a goal and scope for an LCA study. So using your ISO uh, 14040 framework, how do we exactly set up the goal and scope? Let's look into the diagram that is on the left side. Uh, we do have diagram from a construction company that is using basically reused construction consumables for some other buildings. So the first part they have done is set some sort of a goal and a scope. So exactly what have they set? First thing is, uh, the first phase they start with this raw material extraction, followed by transportation, then building material production, then transportation, then construction. So all these things are something that have some sort of an embodied energy. So exactly what is embodied energy is something that you can't really see. Uh, as something that already carries energy supposedly i say that building material production i'm making some sort of steel and the steel has already used some sort of energy some form of energy that might be either from scope one emissions that might be either from scope two that can be from scope three but what is exactly happening uh, i have also used some sort of a water as well but exactly what is happening that i am not able to see uh, the energy physically present in that object so this is something known as embodied energy or the hidden energy which you can't see but the energy has already been consumed for making or producing that particular product so this is basically your embodied energy so the first thing they have said is all set of processes that carry embodied energy the next part is basically usage during the usage they are using some sort of lightning for applications they are using some sort of water so all these things are basically coming in usage and where all this uh, source of electricity is coming that is basically from solar wind or hydraulic so in terms of usage they have set a goal uh, they have set a region they have set a temporal boundary they have set a geographical region as well like this might be for a particular geographical region this might be for any sort of a country or this might be for any sort of a uh, local setting as well and finally, what they said is the end of life cycle, that is demolition, transportation, and finally into landfill. Obviously, all these processes consume some sort of energy. They consume some sort of non-renewable uh, process, non-renewable products. And finally, what is happening, We they might be going for recycling the building materials. So exactly what they have done, they have divided their study into five key parts. The first one is embodied energy. The next one is the emissions, the energy content during the usage phase, then we do have the end of life cycle phase, then do we do have the recycling phase. And finally, we are also looking into the renewable energy that has been consumed. That might include any sort of scopes of emissions, scope one, scope two, or scope three. So this is exactly how do we set up our boundaries. And exactly in terms of scope, as I mentioned in my previous slide as well, I like to go back to that once again. Basically, uh, selecting the assessment parameters, the impacts that shall be assessed, similarly scoping the product system, deciding which activities and processes belong to the life cycle. So exactly for this study, they have taken all these processes that will be discussed or their impact will be studied for the life cycle assessment. Similarly, we do have another study and uh, we do have goal and scope setting from another study. So basically what they have done is define the system boundaries, exactly what sort of processes are they going to study, 
Uh, then there is a technosphere layer, then is an ecosphere layer. So basically they are not considering the ecosphere or the technosphere environment. They are exactly looking into some certain process. So this is basically setting your goal and scope. And finally, I told you that we really need to know what sort of an assessment is being carried. So it might be, we might be getting some sort of environmental emission oriented uh, study. We might be getting some sort of energy requirements. We might be going for uh, mating uh, various environmental indicators. We might go for mating various health indicators. So all these forms of assessments can be performed in an LCA study. I do hope that with this thing, uh, most of your concepts relevant to goal and scope would have been cleared so far. Okay, the next part is basically our inventory analysis. Before we conduct our inventory analysis, there are some important things that need to be discussed. The first one is authenticity of data. Similarly, we do need to know the scalability of data and finally the availability of data, which is most important part. Obviously, in our first part in previous slide, where we have already set the goal, there is a potential that I might be getting some sort of transportation data, but that is not valid. There is a potential I might not be getting any sort of data that is relevant to the usage. So exactly that iterative process thing or that diagram, just keep that in mind. Exactly if I have already uh, set up my goal and scope for the study, but uh, finally I come to know that I'm not able to get the right uh, data, neither the data is re reliable for these two factors, then there is a chance that I might take these phases or these stages out of my study because I really need to make sure that my study is more reliable and more accurate rather than simply giving vague values. So, but let me make you understand that if you remove these stages from your supposedly product A or process A, similarly, you are obviously, this is a comparative study, you might be mating this with a product B or a process B. You need to do or you need to follow the same principle with process B as well. This can't be that you simply have raw material extraction, then transportation, then everything for product A and you uh, emit transportation and HVAC just because you don't have the data. So that is not the right way to basically set your goal and scope. So exactly moving further into inventory analysis, what inventory analysis is. Inventory analysis collects information about the physical flows in terms of input of resources, deals, semi-products and products, and output of emissions, waste and valuable products for the product system. Similarly, the outcome of inventory analysis is the life cycle inventory, a list of quantified physical elementary flows for the product system that is associated with the provision of the service or function described by the functional unit. Great concept set so far. Let's move into details exactly what inventory analysis is and how do we carry that thing. All right, people. This is basically an example of process modeling. Exactly what is happening. Process has been divided into two streams. The first one is your upstream, followed by a downstream. Upstream is more towards acquisition of raw materials at supplier stage and from the sub suppliers exactly taking into account all sorts of scopes of emission that might be from transportation, R&D, marketing, or electricity supply. Similarly, they have set a downstream that is dealing more towards the customer or the production of it. So basically, they are going for a window assembly that is using window glass, window frame. Obviously, you need electricity as well. Window glass is being made from natural gas. Similarly, each and every bit is connected and we are able to see that exactly what sort of a process is being followed. So once we are basically either using that or taking that further later into the waste management process, obviously there are some sort of renewable and non-renewable resources that are being consumed. That can be our electricity supply, that can be our transportation, administrative costs or administrative energies, furnace for glass recycling, incineration plant for the frames, so all these things are basically telling you that exactly what are the inputs and the outputs for this particular process that is more towards uh, window assembly, making windows and finally putting them or dumping them by the end of life cycle. So exactly, uh, the author for the study has tried to measure each and every stage for the entire life cycle of your windows frame. Getting ahead, 
this is basically simply a process modeling exactly what are the stages, what are the parameters that you are going to intake or incorporate in your life cycle assessment study. So we will. Unit process and scale. Input and output flows, we already discussed that. So supposedly we have this process. For this process, we have an input of material X that is 1500 kg per year. Against that, we get an output of product Y that is 1000 kg per year. And similarly, the process is emitting 5,500 kilograms of NOx or any what sort of emission per year. So basically the input is equivalent to uh, output plus your emissions. And this is basically simply just making one functional unit or one simple input and output flows for every sort of process that have been discussed in the previous slide. So for example, I might have this process and what I'm exactly doing is telling people that natural gas is being used for making window glass, window glass is being used for making window assembly, that thing is being used, finally being waste man, and the waste is being managed. How is that being managed? We are looking into transportation, we are looking into electricity supply as well. So basically, we set a unit, we make up uh, the input and the output flows, we tell exactly what sort of quantity is required, what is the uh, possible output, and what are the possible emissions. So exactly if we need to scale that thing by the annual production rate that is 1000 kg per year, we're dividing these things simply by 1000, we get that for every 1000 kg, we have to input 1.5 kilogram of X, that gives us one kilogram of product, and for making that one kg of product Y, what is being done that we are emitting up to 0.5 kilogram of emissions. So exactly what we have done here is we have scaled our results for what? For 1000 kilogram per year production. So this is basically scaling and we have also set up the units that is kilogram per year. So hopefully you have now better idea exactly about what inventory analysis is. We uh, we exactly set up our process modeling that is this thing the next part we do is our unit process and scaling up to certain level of units and finally uh, there is something known as inventory databases that uh, can be found anywhere uh, through using internet but obviously most of them are paid services but uh, you may use unpaid uh, versions as well and uh, unpaid versions can also help you or conducting your study. So exactly how these uh, databases will be beneficial for you. Try to really understand this thing because this is something that is more relevant to your assignment work that will be given to you by end of your week two. So the first one is equipment. That's a pay service as well, but obviously you have uh, some free results as well. Similarly, we have Gobi LCA database that is most commonly used. Swedish Life Cycle Center, then NREL for the US. Similarly, in Germany, we have something Oko Bordet. These all are databases that are uh, equipment is being used for European life cycle uh, assessment studies. So all these databases are something that what they have they done is they have already unit processed something. They have already made models for things. They have already scaled them up to a certain level of production. So exactly what you can do for your assignment if supposedly I say that exactly I need to know the life cycle assessment or the overall energy consumption that is required for the production of polypropylene from the time it uh, gets into raw material phase to the time it's used and finally to the time it's decomposed or recycled that is more like a cradle to cradle study if you can recall from your previous lecture what are exactly eco invent or things might let me know that they do already have values for these processes what you can do that you can alter your unit process there might be some process relevant to your company or relevant to your product that might be different from what is being followed around the world uh, supposedly if eco invent is telling you something about friends there is a high chance that they are taking up all scope to emissions relevant to non-renewable resources because france is more uh, dependent towards nuclear en er energy so you need to have a different set of values for if you are performing a study for a country like Pakistan, you need to really have different set of values. You really need to have different sort of factors. But obviously, at end of the day, your entire unit process, the process for polypropylene, polyethylene, whatever exactly you are focusing for, those values are already available in these databases. So this is something that might help you for your assignment as well. 
and is the best part in terms of inventory analysis. All right. Once we have completed setting our goal and scope, the next part that we completed our inventory analysis as well. The final part is getting onto your LCIA, that is life cycle impact assessment. That is the last bit of ISO 1440. But what is happening? The impact assessment translates the physical flows and interventions of the product system into impacts on the environment using knowledge and models from environmental science. So what are the key elements that are required in the impact assessment stage? All the first three that are in this white oval shape are the mandatory requirements for an LCIA. Similarly, the next two are something that are not mandatory requirements, but can be used in case you want to improve your study. So getting on with the first element, selection of impact category exactly, which impacts do I need to assess? That is something you have already performed in your goal and scope setting. So exactly once you come below, once you have already, you have conducted the study, you have a data analysis of each and everything, you have modified your unit processes, or you have used the standard unit processes, your entire life cycle stages are synchronous and connected to each other. You are exactly clear about what, where your study starts from, where does the study end from, exactly you're clear about the functional units, exactly you know, and I, you have an idea exactly about what sort of scales or what sort of degree of scaling do you need so finally in impact assessment there is a chance that in my previous stage that was inventory analysis i might have achieved some sort of results through data modeling but there is a chance i might not have achieved some sort of result so i might go back to my goal and scope i might set my goal and scope in a different way or i might set my assessment boundaries in a different way so basically exactly for this thing what i do is that which impact do i really need to assess do i really need to look into the human health do i really need to look into the environmental factors do i really need to look into some other factors as well similarly the next part is classification of elementary flows from the inventory so what does this tell me that which impacts just each LCI result contribute to. So basically, uh, I'm really interested. The first part that I really want to know that which impacts am I assessing? Human health oriented, climatic oriented, or environmental oriented. The next part is classification of the elementary flows, which impacts does each LCI result contribute to. Basically for my inventory analysis, exactly what this impact factor is contributing to is that contributing towards the environmental factors is that contributing towards the human health factors before this i should have already told you that the midpoint and the endpoint indicators that was covered a bit in your previous lecture as well but don't worry we do have uh, that thing coming up in the slides in the next slides uh, similarly we do have characterization using environment basically how much does each lci result contribute so basically, this is more of a calculation that how much each sort of an impact category is contributing to or how much each sort of a process is contributing to any particular sort of impact category. Okay, getting on to our point four, that is normalization is used to inform about the relative magnitude of each of the characterized scores for the different impact categories that is basically is that much or that is that enough and finally we do have grouping or weighting supports comparison across the impact categories that is basically aggregating several impact indicator results into a group we may group them or we may put the impact results as individual results so let me give you a summary of exactly what lcia is in the most reasonable or the most logical form first thing is what impact do i need to really assess that might be i might really need to assess the eutrophication potential i might really need to assess the global warming potential i might be assessing the greenhouse gas emissions i might be assessing the amount of energy input required similarly the next part is which impact does each lci results contribute to so basically in my previous slides i told you about unit processing i told you about input and output flows so basically what i am con uh, concerned now is that basically relative to all the flows that i have made what is the impact category that is being affected supposedly i do have a data 
for the energy input i do have the data for the energy output as well so possibly i might get some sort of values in terms of greenhouse gas emissions or some any sort of global warming potential emissions whatever the values or however my flows are working i can have a better idea to exactly how my flows work to certain level of impact similarly the next part is how much does each lca result contribute so basically that is more towards scaling your results uh, how much each impact is contributing that might be global warming might be uh, high for some product global warming might be low for some product similarly i might get to a measuring eutrophication that can be higher due to some process that can be lower due to some process and similarly the next two features are more like uh, not mandatory features but still they can be used in your life cycle impact assessment they are more towards your research progress in case you are working for research so you really need to know about the normalization you really need to go for the sensitivity analysis and finally you may group them either in environmental hazards you may group multiple results into climatic conditions you may group multiple results into human health indicators so all these things are something that are more relevant to your LCI. Moving ahead to people, uh, what I told you about the indicators, the midpoint and the endpoint indicators. So basically for this slide, what we are going to, uh, I'm going to tell you that in terms of inventory results, we might have an idea about the climatic change. Possibly we might have an uh, idea about the ozone depl uh, depletion, possible human toxicity, particulate matter formation. So all these indicators are your midpoint indicators. And finally, they are resulting in some endpoint indicators that might be your human health, that can be your natural environment, or that can be your natural resources. So basically, midpoint indicator, something that happens, the most quickest reaction or the most quickest output for any sort of a process, you can see is your midpoint indicator. An endpoint indicator is something that you need you see over a period of time. Supposedly, the human is being exposed to toxicity. So that is what that is more of uh, the first indicator or the first result that you might see because of some sort of process. And finally, the endpoint indicator is that it is affecting your what your human health. So this is the most quickest definition that the uh, midpoint is something that is visible at the first time or as the first results or as instant result and similarly the endpoint is something that is visible over a period of time so these are your midpoint and endpoint indicators and all these indicators are basically relating towards either human health natural environment or natural resources so this is how you can basically group your uh, life cycle assessment indicators into various forms or various impact categories all right people this is more of telling you about exactly what are the LCIA standards that are being followed across the world and what impact categories do they really measure. So the first one is CML baseline that can measure your acidification, climate change, resource depletion, ecotoxicity. We can't measure energy usage, but you can measure eutrophication, human toxicity, other things can't be measured, then you might go for ozone layer depletion. So each of these standards are basically standards that are adopted worldwide and each of these standards has a various degree of impacts that can be measured. So in case I go for CED, that is cumulative energy demand, I can only measure the energy requirements for any sort of process. My process might have some sort of input, output and obviously some sort of emissions as well. So using the process, I can really measure that what is the input energy, it resulted in how much output energy and what sort of emissions were emitted that can be done using some other standards. So multiple standards can also be used for your life cycle assessment study. You can't simply need to rely on single one indicator or a single one standard. You may use multiple indicators and multiple standards for your study. And it is also not mandatory. Like if you use any other standard like eco indicator, that is not mandatory that you really need to go through all of these impact areas. You might pick up a few of them and might, might put them up as defined by the eco indicator standard 99. This is basically exactly how these uh, standards across the world are being followed. The timeline of what is being used, uh, what is their name. Uh, it started from eco indicator 99. Uh, impact 2002 plus that is still more of a common uh, standard that is still being used similarly we do have impact world plus that is more dealing towards the 
global impact. Similarly, for the European Union as well, they, they have their own standards. And these are various categories along with their country names to exactly what sort of standards are being followed across various countries. So we will the last bit of your LCA study. That is your interpretation phase. Obviously, interpretation is working simultaneously along with, with each and every stage of your life cycle assessment study. So basically, supposedly I set my goal and scope. I interpret that, all right, I do have this data. This is my life cycle stages. And my interpretation is more of a qualitative assessment to exactly what I have done through using diagrams or through my mathematical calculations. So this is more of a qualitative assessment to whatever I've done or more of a qualitative explanation to what I've done. So basically, let's see what uh, interpretation is all about. It's basically a phase of life cycle assessment in which the findings of either the inventory analysis or the impact assessment or both are evaluated in relation to the defined goal and scope in order to reach the conclusions and recommendations. ISO, ISO defines interpretation as identification of significant issues. Obviously, in your entire study, you might have multiple issues. You might have multiple gaps. The data might not be reliable. You really need to think about who your audience is. You really need to think about what your uh, what the deliverables of the paper are. are. So uh, uh, working across this sort of a paper or this sort of a practice, there are a lot much issues that you might face. A few of them I have already told you. The next thing is an evaluation that considers completeness, sensitivity, and consistency checks. Obviously, you really need to make sure that your data is consistent. You have carried out some sort of a sensitivity analysis, and obviously, uh, the data is complete. The life cycle stages that you have defined are more of a complete nature. You can't simply skip more of things because that will be leading to something more of unreliable results. So, and part is that you really need to rely on making more reliable and accurate results so you can't really skip each and every skip uh, part just because you don't have data availability you might go for some sort of experimental study as well the next part is uh, interpretation deals with conclusions limitations and recommendations obviously that is a part of uh, every sort of uh, research study that goes on appropriateness of the definitions of the system functions the functional units whatever you have used gigajoules megajoules you might have used a kilo tons of carbon dioxide equivalent equivalent or something else so it all depends on exactly what sort of indicator have you used and what are the units for uh, through which you have measured your uh, entire study similarly it also tells limitations of the data quality assessment and the sensitivity analysis so these are some of the parts as i told you earlier more of a qualitative assessment or explanation to whatever you have done through numerical calculations or through diagram diagrammatic explanations so people i'll try to summarize this uh, all about life cycle assessment that we have studied so far so this concludes your basics of life cycle assessment sessions hopefully we'll have a uh, an interactive session sooner uh, this uh, during this week so before that uh, just let me summarize all the points that we have gone through the first thing is that lca is a comparative study obviously you can't use lca for an absolute study you need to have a comparison to some other sort of a process or some other product or some other site as well the next part is that LCA is an environmental accounting method which takes into account all phases of the life cycle. As I told you, life cycle starts from raw material acquisition to the processing, to manufacturing, to distribution, end of uh, usage, then end of life cycle disposition, and possibly you might go for recycling. So there are multiple processes that are happening during the across entire life cycle stages. So you need to incorporate most of the process for which you do have the data availability or which are most significantly contributing you to, to your overall results. Similarly, LC has multiple application areas in production, food, chemicals, and many other related industries that we have already discussed in the previous lecture session. LCA can be used as a means of environmental optimization. Obviously, once you conduct your LCA study, you are able to identify the gaps across the entire stages of the life cycle. As I told you in the application areas that the companies are basically more concerned about 
exactly how much emissions are being contributed more either in the downstream or in the upstream. So they really might optimize their operations based on whatever results you get through LC. ISO 1414 is the most common framework used for measuring LCA. And exactly what ISO 1440 is, that is goal and scope definition. You set your goals, you set your parameters, you set your boundaries, tell the users, you look into your audience, you see what are the deliverables, you define what sort of an assessment or what sort of standards you are going to carry forward. That is an initial stage. Next part, inventory analysis, unit processing, process modeling, scaling your results, basically putting up all the input and the output flows for each and every stage of your life cycle, how the stages are interlinked with each other, how the stages are connected with each other, that is all that you do through unit processing, process modeling, and you use your life cycle assessment databases as well. Similarly, the next part was impact assessment. So in impact assessment, basically we might be using some sort of standard, picking some sort of impacts that are affecting our process, and finally putting up the results that are contributing towards our product or process. And finally, the stage of interpretation that is working simultaneously with each and every phase of life cycle assessment. I told you earlier, it is more of a qualitative explanation to whatever you have done through all these phases. So people, I do hope that at the conclusion of this lesson so far, you have come to know exactly what life cycle assessment is, what are the application areas of life cycle assessment, and finally, for this lecture particularly, you should be able to know what are the standards for used to measure your life cycle assessment. With this, we come to an end to our session two. Hopefully, see you in session three. Thanks for attending the session. See you soon.